Um, before we call the candidates up, I just real quickly, I've, I've already had a question. What exactly does county government do, <laughs> uh, aside from meeting periodically? And your county government manages the Department of Corrections for the county. We manage the Sheriff's Department, including dispatch. We have the county attorney's office, the register of deeds. We run the county nursing home. We run the county farm. And we also have an administrative staff. So uh, we have a pretty good sized operation there in Haverhill. And hopefully, we are going to add all Democrats to the county staff. So at this point, um, I'll, I'd ask the candidates for county attorney and sheriff and register of deeds to just come up and grab a seat. And also, we have what I pray is our next county commissioner. Marcia, would you come up as well? And you all can just get comfortable because I want to take just a second uh, to recognize Bill Bolton, who's running for the Senate in District 2. Uh, I have worked with his opponent. We need Bill. Yeah. <laughs> and I would also like anybody running for the House, anybody that's going to run for the House in this upcoming election, stand up, please. This is your legislative branch of county government, and some of them don't even know it yet. But they're the ones that will approve the budget when it's all over. So the plan tonight is to just introduce you to the three uh, primary county offices that have primaries. The uh, county attorney's office, which is responsible for uh, prosecuting felonies at the circuit court level. They manage our alternative sentencing programs. Uh, they do assist circuit court prosecutors. They work with the victim witness program. I'm sorry, superior court. <laughs> the, and I know that. <laughs> you just wouldn't know. I know I know it. Um, yeah, there, in the court systems in Grafton County, there is a circuit court level where there are four courts, and then there is the superior court level, which handles the more serious felony issues. Let me see if I do better on the Register of Deeds. Uh, the, reg the Register of Deeds maintains a permanent record of all property transactions uh, amongst other duties. Uh, they are available, they probably see the public more often than anybody else in the county. And hopefully not as often as the sheriff. <laughs> Our sheriff's department predominantly handles uh, prisoner transport, court security, they assist local law enforcement when it's necessary, and they serve civil processes. So that's a little bit of what these folks, three of them will be doing come the end of November. I'd like to start off with the county attorney's candidates. So if you would like to just come on up. Marcy. Hey, Nate. Nate hey. Gray's on my right, your left, and Marcy. Hornick, um, and I'd like to start off by giving each of you about three minutes to just talk about your candidacy and what you hope to accomplish as the county attorney. Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Nate. Sure. Hi, so I'm Nate Grays. I am currently the prosecutor up in Littleton. I've been up there for four years now. Uh, before that, I was at the New Hampshire Attorney General's office for about a year. I worked in the Criminal Bureau. Uh, I did mostly appellate work, so I argued in front of the Supreme Court, uh, but I, I worked a little bit on in the Homicide Division. Uh, before that, I was at law school at William and & Mary, and I uh, worked my third year at the FBI. There are three areas that I really want to focus on as county attorney. I want to improve our drug, mental health, and veterans courts to the extent we have those courts. Um, I want to work with my legislators to close some of the loopholes in the law that, I've, that I see um, because I think that we can do better with our laws. Some of them just need some updating. And the third thing I want to do is I want to work more closely with my community partners, especially in domestic and sexual violence, um, because what they do is really important. And what we have learned is that if we really help our community partners, those partners um, and the services they provide to people in the community make the people in the community more likely to come back and help us prosecute cases. Uh, I know that um, we've talked a little bit about um, the county attorney's office and what that office does, but I've already had a couple questions about 
what do you do as a prosecutor? So my job as a prosecutor is really to review cases. Um, so I, if somebody comes in and reports a crime, the police do an investigation and they make a determination about um, whether a crime has occurred or not occurred. And oftentimes, if they've determined that a crime occurred, they get a warrant, they, they arrest the person who committed the crime. I then review that arrest, um, make a determination about whether I feel those are the appropriate charges, um, and then we proceed with the criminal case. So essentially, I'm the person who calls you up on the phone and says, hey, what do you want to get out of this case? Um, I also ask the police what they want, uh, and I have to take in considerations the community interests um, and thoughts um, and what they want. And I know I'm getting really close to my three minute mark, aren't I? So, uh, one, minute. one minute, all right. We have a timekeeper this time. We did not have a timekeeper on Monday, so us lawyers just kept talking and talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so once that happens, I present the case to the court. Um, I'm in charge of uh, bringing all the witnesses in, um, figuring out what order they should be presented in, dealing with any issues that may come up and um, proving that case beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard in every criminal court in this, um, in this country. And that's a really important job um, because your job as a prosecutor is to do justice, not merely convict. So sometimes you get to be the unpopular person and say, hey, you know, I, I know this person did something bad, but I think it's more appropriate that they go into some alternative program like drug court or mental health court because uh, they're an addict or they have a mental illness and it's just not going to solve the problem if we put them in jail. Um, we can do something better. Thank you. And I'm Marcy Hornick and I live in Littleton, New Hampshire. I've lived off and on up in Littleton for about 30 years. Uh, for the last 15 years I've been a public defender. I'm the, presently the managing attorney of the northernmost public defender office that's located in Littleton. We represent clients who are, I mean, you probably understand what a public defender does, but we are charged with upholding the constitutional rights of people who are charged with crimes that could land them in jail who cannot afford to hire attorneys. And so I'm the managing attorney of that office. We represent people in all of COAS, all of northern uh, Grafton County, so I have worked with Nate in the Littleton Circuit Court where he has been for the last few years. He mentioned that he was at the Attorney General's Office in New Hampshire. I was in the, new, uh, the main Attorney General's Office uh, for uh, the better part of a, well, a semester really when I was in law school. And I found it wonderful work. Um, what ended up happening though was I was offered a job as a public defender in a place I really love and that's where I've been. Um, I've done superior court cases, jury trials, um, cases ranging from homicide to sexual assault to uh, burglaries, uh, drug cases, you name them practically, I have been some part of a, of a case. I've tried countless jury trials in Grafton County, some against our current county attorney, Lara Sappho, uh, so, and some against the other attorneys in that office, so I have a pretty good solid working relationship with them. I feel like with my experience both uh, working in, and some of you may not know this, but Grafton County Superior Court is really the hub of this big, large county. Uh, Linda was talking about the four courts. There's a circuit court in Littleton, Haverhill, here in Plymouth, and in Lebanon. Um, but it's Grafton County Superior Court and the county attorney's office that prosecutes those big those big cases. It's in Superior Court where there is the drug court, the felony drug court. And that was an initiative that was started several, well, 14 years ago, the conversation started where people understood that there had to be a shift in how we were dealing with people who were committing crimes and who also were uh, highly caught up in substance use. And so there is a whole paradigm shift where let's not just send people off to jail or prison where they're not gonna get any help and understand what to do get any tools when they get out of prison, let's give them an opportunity to try to uh, give them the support, give them the, the treatment, and get them back, on the, on, uh, back in their communities, rebuilding the bridges that they burned before they uh, went into, got caught up in their um, substance abuse. I have a real soft heart for kids. Um, and as you all know, there's Katie here and in uh, Bristol uh, that provides services for youth. Um, we also, in different circuit courts around the county, have uh, local sexual assault 
uh, agencies that assist the prosecutors um, and the defendant, I mean the uh, victims in sexual assault cases. So my intention is, my vision is, improve the relationship with law enforcement across the community. It's a, a, a whole different ball of wax between what they think in the northern part of the county to the southern part of the county. Um, make sure that victims' voices are heard, especially children. Continue to work to improve the uh, alternative sentencing courts, both the drug court, the mental health court, as well as the veterans court that I was a founding member of in this state. Um, and then try to write a budget that everybody thinks is fair. Thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, I'm going to be asking a few questions, uh, just hopefully to get you some idea of uh, the uh, positions of our candidates. I'll ask them each to limit their responses to about two minutes. Um, we'll go through each of the county offices in the same way, and at the end, we're going to open up the floor, and you can ask any questions you would like, hopefully about the office, not the person, like, where did you get that good-looking suit? <laughs> <laughs> But um, I'm going to start with, since both of you mentioned all, and that nice looking blouse, yes. Ah, Talbot. Talbot, <laughs> ah. Since both of you mentioned alternative sentencing programs, the Grafton County Attorney's Office is actively involved already in a wide range of alternative sentencing initiatives. We have drug court, we have mental health court, we have uh, a veterans court, we have a juvenile diversion, we have an adult diversion program. My question is, um, the county has limited resources. We can't fund everything. Um, what do you think is not being funded properly at this point? What would you change and how would you argue to your county commissioners to do that change? <laughs> Any volunteers? Sure. Um, Linda, you hit on some very good points because there are some great programs that have already uh, had pretty solid foundation out of the county attorney's office. Lara Safo wrote a bunch of grants that help some of those courts get started. The Veterans Court is more in our circuit's courts. It's more of a track up here. We have a, um, a, 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 a team member from the VA, Mike Owens, who's the Veterans Involved uh, Justice Outreach Coordinator. So we were able to bring him in on our local mental health court team to provide assistance. So. To answer your question, what I would do is involve the community some more. We do have the resources that I referred to earlier, the outreach resources. What we're missing, though, in the local areas is that people don't want to be, for some reason, they don't want to be LADAC. And somebody asked me what a LADAC was. It's a licensed alcohol and drug abuse counselor because it doesn't pay. And yet the need, the necessity for those is huge. So we need to, as a society, take a better look, focus on the type of um, people that we really need to um, add to the team and make, that the, make sure that the pay that's being offered for them is worth the investment that they make in schooling. We need some more people to understand the mental health issues and to go into that field. There's, just, there's such a need for care providers that um, some of our schools have limited those classes because the uh, student uh, debt uh, issue is so overwhelming. Um, so when I go to the county commissioner, <clears throat> I'm going to say, I'm going to write a grant, I'm going to get some uh, federal money. The feds have already brought some money down uh, with the, um, through the U.S. Attorney's Office where they brought four prosecutors in the lower two uh, counties to deal with the fentanyl issue. So I would be asking them to sort of bridge their work that they're doing there to help us in Grafton County also deal with these same issues. Um, so that would be number one, uh, grants and, and uh, reach out to the feds. I'd also use some of our community stakeholders who uh, understand these issues and who want to help and try to uh, put together uh, groups in each of the four hubs of the county. I say hubs, the spokes, the different where the uh, circuit courts are. Put the groups together, the, the, the stakeholders who are involved, the people who provide the treatment, the uh, medical professions, the educators, uh, parent groups, and let's all work together, uh, law enforcement obviously, let's all work together and see what ideas we can come up with to do preventative work so that we may not have to go to Linda Laura, Lauer and the rest of the commissioners to ask for money because we're working community uh, within the community first to do preventive work before we have to ask them for help on the outside. I mean, uh, uh, after a fact, uh, after. So the, we were working the before, before, before we have to ask for money for the after. Thank you. 
Well, it's hard to disagree with anything that Marcy said because I think she was right on point here. Um, one of the things we really have to do is work out, work with our community organizations. And um, one of the things that we've I've learned during the course of the campaign is there are a lot of people in the community who want to get involved and just don't know how. And that's something that we need to do better outreach on. Um, and I've also learned a lot more about grants than I knew about before, to be honest. Um, one of my police departments, Littleton, um, did a, a drug sweep essentially um, a few months ago. And one of the things we had looked at was, you know, how can we get federal funding? One of the big issues that we have, especially in Grafton County, is we have a fentanyl issue that's just as big as anywhere else if you look at it per population, but we don't have that federal resources. And one of the things that I'd like to do is um, start something like a Grafton County Drug Task Force because that would allow uh, a bunch of different agencies to come together and we'd be able to actually um, qualify for a lot of those grants that we just don't qualify for right now. And I think if we look at the different little aspects like that, we end up getting more federal attention, we end up getting more state attention, and that's something we all know, especially those of us up in the northern part of Grafton County, that we're, we're way up there, nobody thinks about us, and uh, we really need to do more with that. Um, and as far as what I'd like to see funded more, one of my priorities would be looking at the programs we have now and seeing if we can improve their services. One of the things that I've been talking about is the drug court. When we set it up 10 years ago, it was really well designed. The problem was that was before the opiate crisis. Now more than half of our crimes are drug related. And many of those are opiate related. I'm sure the sheriffs will talk about there's meth, there's, there's cocaine as well. Um, but what are we gonna do about those and how do we expand that in a way that both takes into consideration the, uh, the limited resources we have along with the needs of the community? And I'd like to talk about that more, but I'm out of time here. play musical microphones here. Okay, it's the first week of January and you've just been sworn in as the new county attorney. What would your first order of business be? What would you like to accomplish in that first week? All right, so in that first week, I'd like to set the priorities for the office over the next two years. Um, one of the things I'm really passionate about is thinking ahead five years and 10 years. How is the justice system gonna look from that perspective backwards. One of the things that I have to do first, and I'm sure Marcy would agree with this, is whoever, whichever one of us takes that position, the first thing we need to do is sit down with all of the employees that are there now and talk with them about their perspectives about what could be improved with the office. That's not something you can really do while someone else is in charge. Um, you know, you have, to, you have to be in charge first before you can have that open conversation. Um, I've already talked with all of the, I believe all of the police chiefs in the county about issues that they've seen. Um, and, you know, I have my three areas based on that. That's, that's what I want to focus on. Um, working on, you know, how can we improve our alternative sentencing programs? How can we help more people and not spend a whole lot more money? Um, I'd like to do more with outreach because one of the things I've, I learned as a prosecutor now is there really aren't people who go out and talk about changes in the law. The legislature um, thinks of, you know, here's a problem that somebody brought to our attention and they change it, but they don't really know things like um, if they're, you know, what is the law surrounding um, surveillance cameras in convenience stores? Um, currently, if there are audio recordings being made and the convenience store does not have the proper posting on the wall, those recordings can't be used by the police in this subsequent investigation if someone goes and robs that store. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense because everyone who walks into a convenience store knows their cameras. And it doesn't make a whole lot of sense because um, in our small communities, you know, even if the guy's wearing a mask, you put that video on Facebook, someone's gonna recognize the voice. Um, so that's one of the changes that I wanna make. The very first thing that I would do if I was, when I'm sworn in, or if I'm sworn in, is to call a meeting uh, with the attorneys in that office. The attorneys in that office deal with um, all kinds of different people, not just law enforcement, but victims, witnesses. They are constantly in trial prep. They're constantly, it's, it's a nonstop job. And there are different pressures on them that 
you know, as Nate says, he's spoken to the police chiefs. There's so much change and so many different things that are going on in this county. So in the northern part of the county, that law enforcement agencies or those law enforcement agencies have an entirely different perspective than some of the law enforcement agencies have in the lower part of the county. Some of them really believe in the uh, alternative sentencing programs, and some of them in other parts of the county do not. And they want to know why the jail isn't, why the jail has so many empty beds. Um, it's a tough, you know, it's a, a tough bridge to make. It's a tough bridge to try to, uh, to, to build. But I intend to, with the input from those prosecutors, many of whom deal with those law enforcement agencies, again, on a regular basis, say, how can we work this out? How can we figure this out? And if my role initially becomes, after we assess all the cases that we've opened, and after we make sure that we're on top of what's going on because of jury trial schedule, people's schedule, and gee whiz, the everyday life of a, of a working person with kids um, in that office, let's see how we can connect everybody together so that with the increase of drug use, drug misuse, and the other changes that are coming to this county, uh, let's figure out how we can work together to address that. So very first, very first order of business would be a sit down conversation about those issues. Okay, and uh, since you brought up the issue of empty beds in the Department of Corrections, um, we do have empty beds in the Department of Corrections and we think some of it is due to bail reform and there are more bail reform initiatives coming down the pike. So could you very quickly talk about your perspective on the impact of those bail reform initiatives? Sure. Um, September 1st, there is a change in the law, uh, in, our, in our bail law. Uh, essentially what it does is it keeps the discretion with the judges as to what bail they can, um, they can impose. Uh, it changes a couple of areas of language. Uh, it's still going to address the issues of dangerousness to self or to others. But this whole change really came about as a result of a concern that people who were well, wealthy or who had money were getting better bail offers than those who are homeless and indigent, uh, had no money, that those were the people that were spending more time in jail. And so this is, this is an attempt by the legislature to balance out that inequity. Whether it, it does or not, um, it really doesn't change much at all. Uh, again, it leaves the discretion with the judges to do something. It may be that from above, you know, from above the judiciary may have said, Let's, let's not be so harsh on bail. I mean, we just read in California that they just got rid of cash bail pretrial. Um, there are empty beds at the jail. I mean, I'm just gonna divert quickly to the jail thing, but uh, Superintendent Elliott has been doing a bang up job, job of coming up with a uh, drug alternative sort of sentencing program within the jail to help people transition out. And he's also offering pretrial services, which, he, which hasn't happened before. So those are very positive steps. We're probably not going to fill those beds anytime soon, Linda. Um, the people that are dangerous and need to be held will still be able to be held, so the bail reform isn't going to change any of that. The people that um, shouldn't be held because they're homeless, and I'm telling you, there are some judges who consider that as a reason to incarcerate people, um, that is going to be taken out of the conversation, hopefully, and out of the thought process. Thank you. So as, as Marcy described, there are really two areas that the bail reform statute touches on, which are the same as they used to be. First is risk of flight, which is someone's not going to show up for court. And the second is dangerousness to self or others. I think that the legislature did a really, really good job on the risk of flight part. Um, that was really goes to the homelessness, really goes to whether someone's an addict. The problem I see is with the dangerousness section, because the there was a change in the law so that at the bail hearing, the amount of proof that the prosecutor has to um, bring now is uh, clear and convincing evidence. And that didn't used to be the case. And I know that's a very legal technical term. Um, so just to give you kind of the overview, um, proof beyond a reasonable doubt is what you need to prove a case at, at criminal trial at. And that is no reasonable person would disagree that this person committed this crime against this victim. Uh, clear and convincing evidence is below that, but it's not 
um, it, it, the evidence has to be pretty clear and, and very convincing about what the, um, what actually occurred. And there's no numerical equivalent to it. Um, below that is actually the civil standard of preponderance of an evidence. So that's about 51%. So 51% probability that this occurred. Um, and further below that is, uh, is what you would get arrested on, um, which is that probable cause. And the problem that we have is in domestic cases, um, so um, domestic violence cases, and other violent, violent especially felonies, um, because with, proof, with clear and convincing evidence, one of the things that we need to do is provide enough evidence that's clear and convincing. And at this point, it looks like what we're going to have to do is present witnesses. And that's going to be a big problem if you have to, one of your witnesses has to be the victim who's currently in emergency surgery because you can't interrupt the surgery to bring them to court um, in order to get the person who committed the crime um, held. And they're clearly dangerous. Thank you. And this is going to be a short one. In one minute, why should we vote for you instead of your opponent? No pressure. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Like all of you out there, I want somebody with experience in that county attorney seat. I want somebody with management experience, jury trial experience, superior court experience, experience with complicated uh, cases. Um, I don't want somebody that has to learn as they go. I want somebody to be able to get in there seamlessly walk into that office, take a caseload, and walk downstairs and be able to argue it uh, in front of the judge or prepare for a jury. Um, <clears throat> people wonder, and I'm going to just add this, whether, since I'm a public defender, how could I turn to uh, becoming a prosecutor? Well, the answer is very simple. Um, my job as a public defender is to re represent the clients who are appointed to re that I'm appointed to represent, so zealously uphold their constitutional rights. The other side of that coin is the zealous pursuit of justice on behalf of victims. And so it's still the same system. It's still the same pursuit of justice. I'm the right person because I've got the experience. Thank you. So I already have the prosecutorial experience. And one of the things that prosecutors do that defense attorneys don't have the obligation to do is we have to present all the evidence in a case. And that is the same regardless of what courthouse you're in. Your job is to present all of the evidence. Um, under the Constitution, there's no obligation for the defendant to present any evidence whatsoever. So I once heard it compared to um, stringing together a series of pearls. Each bit of evidence is a different pearl. And so you have one witness, another witness, you know, some photographs, some fingerprints, some DNA, whatever it is. Um, all string together. And the defense lawyer's job is to pick off one of those pearls and break that string. Um, one of the big things I think I do that's different than Marcy's experience is I have to deal with witnesses who come up and testify, and they don't give the testimony that I expect them to give. They change their story. They say something different from what they wrote down or what they told the police. And I have to think on my feet and say, you know, where do I go from here? How do I put this together so that this strand of pearls doesn't fall apart. And I think that's a different perspective from what Marcy has. And that's why I think you should vote for me. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, what do you say we have ladies first? And we'll ask the Register of Deeds candidates to come up. And we have uh, our four-time Register of Deeds, Kelly Monahan, who is running for a fifth term, uh, and Liz Gessler from Orford, who is challenging her. And I would ask each of you for a three-minute statement on what you hope to accomplish as Register of Deeds. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Gessler. Um, the Register of Deeds is an interesting office. It's not an office that can be trained for. You walk in the door when you've been elected, and you're starting from base one. Um, it's the same thing that Kelly experienced when she first won the election and became Register of Deeds. I'm particularly interested in cybersecurity as it relates to our records that are online, 
how to protect people's privacy while at the same time allowing public access to public records. And that would be my main focus, as well as just providing a good customer service per, uh, experience to the people that do come into the office and do phone in, um, and to help them in any way that they need to be helped. Uh, my name is Kelly Jean Monahan. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, where I come from. Um, I'm the great granddaughter of Anastasia Bose Monahan, activist, writer, suffragette. Uh, Mother of 12, divorced by her, my not so great grandfather, Michael Monaghan, uh, who was a pretty famous writer at the time, contemporary of Mark Twain, who used his position as an editor of the All New Press to suppress the right to vote, so the women's suffrage movement. I'm also the proud mother of three sons. Uh, my high school sweetheart and I uh, sacrificed a great deal for me to be an at home mother. Uh, I gave up a, a very prosperous career and, job and business that I loved, but we feel like this energy and effort was paid for thousands of times over. They're leaders, they're out there taking the world by storm. When I moved to Orford 20 years ago, I invested my treasure, my three treasures, with the first interstate school district in the country, K through 12, Rivendell Interstate School District, and that was a good decision. Uh, when I also moved to Orford 20 years ago, one of the first things I did was lend my talent and time to help turn Orford blue with the Orford Democrats, and I never have turned my back on that, including outreach to other surrounding towns. The role of registered deeds brings some of my proudest attri personality attributes. Um, I value my honesty, integrity, my empathy, and my voice above all else, and I bring that to the, my public service. We face a lot of crisis every day. People are frustrated, they're scared, and I have a net, I've built a network where I can point them in the right directions to get that help. We work with them at the counter, we point them in the right direction, and we inform them when they need an attorney and why. Um, you can attempt to take on these roles in a passive way and do what's required. I think with my background, you see that maybe I'm a little bit more proactive than that. Um, recently, I saw that the Connecticut River Dams had sold, and I knew we had the power to help our municipalities. And I went back to 1960, I pulled every easement, and I sent the town's hard copy so they'd have their assessors and their conservation commissions could be forewarned and forearmed. And as of a few weeks ago, Lyme is now being sued for overassessment and Hanover's next. So I want to continue to investigate how to use this database, three million digitized images, more every day, 24,000 subdivision plans, to aggregate that data and be more helpful to our municipalities and our people. Uh, we just had a gallon yesterday that inherited from mom and dad. Five siblings, big, used to own a brick store. And one brother is not liking that well. And we worked with her. We have a service from our software company that's called Property Fraud Alert um, that you can en enroll five names in and you get either an email or a phone call when a document has been recorded. So say you're even scoping a property, a neighbor's property. Put that in and you get a call. Something's happened. If you're not paying your taxes, you maybe get an, uh, an idea that the IRS lien has landed. <laughs> um, things like that. We contain a lot of different documents. Everything that comes into our office, and it's almost 20,000 documents a year. My signature is on almost 160,000 documents. When that document comes in, it is not a legal document submittable in the court of law until my signature and the tax stamp and all our information is attached to that document and scanned into our database. So. It's an obscure office, it's been called obscure office, but it really is, it's the foundation of our economy. Our records prove what assets you own, so you can leverage those assets for a business to send a child to college. It is incredibly important that this official public record remains at the county level. And since Monday, we've already, legislators, you heard from me last year on that takeover at the Trojan Horse, guess what? 1602 is coming back again, fourth year in a row, they're gonna try to take you New Hampshire as a test for an assured deed. It's like a, it's to make a torn system. And he's already got a contract with the Federal Reserve to roll it from New Hampshire across the country to privatize this asset out of the county government. So this is the type of thing we do. We don't talk about it a lot, but um, we just do our work. So I'm very passionate about what I do and I hope to send me back to um, do it for two more years. Thanks. Thank you. Um, the first question 
other than the statutory requirements that are laid out in New Hampshire RSA 478 uh, to keep and protect all records relating to the buying and selling of real property, what do you think the role of the Register of Deeds should be within the community and how will you accomplish that? I'm a real estate nerd. I keep my eye on everything that's going on in the 38 towns in the city of Lebanon. As I said, I had my heads up for the towns. I got a six month notice that we were gonna have problems with the uh, assessments. Um, conservation commissions needed to know we've got problems with erosion coming. They don't know what they're gonna do. So this is all going to court. So it's being proactive, knowing what our towns are facing. Um, Northern Pass, I took office as Northern Pass was rolling out. Ray Burt and I stepped up. I was drawing tears because people were having to come into the office research the deeds that were buried in the 30s and 40s, because most of PSNH granted back then. And I dried a lot of tears when people realized they were going to be affected. So I spent the last eight years of my life as a citizen and as the Register of Deeds testifying. And what I said before the SEC was that I feel that this attempt was a perversion of the original intent of the easement. The easement was designed for a rural person to grant access to electricity to our neighbors to the north never intending it to be used as it was. And that's why I testified time and time again to the SEC and at different hearings. So yes, I'm an activist, Register of Deeds. I'm one of the um, most winning testimonies in Concord from our association. My peers have, if I'm victorious in this election, my peers have nominated me to become the vice president of the association on September 20th when we have our Association of Counties meeting. Um, I'll be the second longest serving register come January the one that attends the national conferences to bring the voice of the citizen New Hampshire to the national conversation. As I said the other night, because as long as greed is an aspect of the human condition, the industries, lobbyists, and the legislators will be coming to take this from the county to privatize it. I really can't disagree with anything that Kelly had to say. Those are the duties over and above what the RSA says to protect people's rights, to walk them through processes when they need help, to um, engage with the towns when they need information. And I don't really have anything more to add to that. That's, those are the things that I would like to bring to the job as well. Okay, um, this question, I think you both got hit with it at the Canaan. There was a forum in Canaan on Monday, um, and Commissioner Piper was ha nice enough to give me her questions, which, <laughs> which makes it very nice for some of these. But the question that was asked, what is one practice or policy of the current Register of Deeds that you would change and why? And then Kelly, I'm going to ask you to defend that policy. Thank you, Linda. I, I, and I don't actually know if I would change this or not, but I've heard from a lot of people in Grafton County that they're concerned about the cost of going online to research records. They would like to see a return to the point when they could log on, they could research titles and not have to pay for it. I understand that. I also understand that A, the county needs money, and B, there's a real concern about cybersecurity. And by charging for access to the, to the records online, we help both of those two things. So I can't honestly say that I have an opinion about that right now. That's something that I would need to formulate after I were elected in office and researching um, all of the constituent pieces of that. Our software company, well, let me back up. In the 1980s, this small uh, mom and pop organization, Connor and Connor in Exeter, New Hampshire, digitized our images and became our computer software company. When they realized how big the industry was getting and the predatory nature of it, they looked around to sell. They sold to Fiddler Technologies of Davenport, Iowa, in business since 1854, selling elections and books to county government. Uh, so Fiddler got into writing the first land record software in the 1980s. They're one of the best in the business. Uh, Davenport, Iowa is probably one of the safest places in our country, and that's where our electronics have backed up, the clouds. How we structured the tiered access, and I was the um, innovator on this, for the outside entities and the lo local real estate, legal, surveyors, whoever needs access, 
$10 a month, $120 a year, to be able to get into the database, print on their own computers, printers, and then we charge them the dollar a page. We make $100,000 a year on a dollar a page to offset your taxes. We process $10 million a year to four different entities. A million and a half this year came back to the county to offset your taxes. By pulling the database offline for free, we, um, the 1,500 accounts or so brings in an extra $45,000. That's insignificant. What it was was their ability to track abuse and use. Um, you know the human condition. If you can get something for free and outsmart everybody, you will. So what I saw was when we took the database down, my revenue skyrocketed on revenue. So people were screen scraping. So we installed a program called Tapestry. You're in a jam, your mom's up here, you need to see her easement, you're in Arizona. There's a convenient system called Tapestry. You can get into the system for $16.95, you swipe that credit card, and you can print on your own printer for $3 a page, and in two minutes you can have your answer. So we've done that convenience, get in. We've got to understand we don't have great internet access here. We are a very diverse demographics county, so we've got a lot of farm owners, timber owners, without internet access, without computer skills. We do things the old-fashioned way, and we'll talk somebody down on the phone. We'll say, this is how much it's going to cost. Put a check in the mail, because we'll take a check for a copy under $10. We are very cheap with your tax dollars. We do not process bad checks. And you'll get it, your deed back in three days. So we try to accommodate all of our needs, and that's why I call it tiered access. So now Bank of America and or the predator in whatever country does not sit on their couch and just troll through your, all your documents looking for your mother's maiden name and where your sister lives. So by, by doing it the way we did, and by the way, I had to fight this in the legislature through two years. My vote in House and County Government was 11 to 0 and 17 to 0 when I presented my case to, to a bipartisan group of our representatives. So that, that question, I believe, is ended on access. Okay, I'd like to move on just, um, our society is becoming more and more electronically based. Uh, Cook County, Illinois is now looking at the option of using Bitcoin in the deeds office. Uh, E-filing is a reality. Um, hacking, property fraud. What challenges do you think the Register of Deeds Office will face as our society becomes more electronically based, and how will you proactively meet those challenges? And this is why I attend our national conference, PREA, Property Records Industry Association, bringing the elected officials responsible for the databases, the bankers, title, big title, and the tech people together. It is an uncomfortable three days, let me tell you, but we just recently went through the e-notary push. And the FBI had to come in and say, settle it down. You cannot Skype a notary. So tech takes leaps, and there's money to be made here. Um, I just got notification yesterday. The federal government said, we want to push to a paperless mortgage. We're not ready for that yet. We still have, our attorneys are not ready for that. E-notary is going to require a one central global timestamp, Greenwich Mean Time. You know what's right after one global timestamp on profit transfer? One global currency. So we're the ones reining these folks in, saying, slow it down a little bit. And it's, it's blockchain, not Bitcoin. In Ontario, uh, the Delaware to form an LLC has already gone to blockchain. They're pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. Cook County is about to go to blockchain for land records. I'm watching it all the time. Ontario just went to. As I said earlier, this is I'm not in the position. I don't have access to the information that would allow me to give you a really solid answer about that. But what I can promise you is that if I'm elected, I would investigate all possible uh, avenues of increasing cybersecurity for our records. Thank you. Okay, and one final question we'll end with. What one thing sets you apart from your opponent? Well, I can use the answer I gave Monday night, which is that she lives in North Orford and I live in South Orford. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
other than that, I think I'm kind of generally a quieter personality than Kelly is. And I'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for coming tonight. And I'm not quiet. I am proactive and loud. <laughs> and I'm a fighter. I believe in private property rights. I believe in the foundation of our government that we can prove what we own. And so I'm very passionate about that and I'm not afraid to say it. Thank you, both of you. Good job. And finally, we have our sheriff candidates. You're up, guys. These guys like each other. This is, this is great. Um, we have Travis Austin and Jeff Stiegler. And we're going to do the same thing that we did with the other offices. If you'd like to start with a three-minute background, whatever you'd like to say about yourself and your candidacy. You going first tonight? Whatever works. I okay. first on Monday. <laughs> Perfect. Um, my name is Jeff Stiegler. Um, I'm a candidate um, on the Democratic ticket for Grafton County Sheriff. Um, I'll begin by taking you back to 1984. I graduated from Woodsville High School, always had aspirations of wanting to be in law enforcement. Thought about going into the military, but the MOS for military police was about six months away, and I just fortunately fell into this job uh, of being a part-time police officer in the town of Littleton. Uh, which subsequently allowed me to elevate a few months later into a full-time position because some people left for some better paying jobs, I guess. And uh, after a couple years there, uh, I guess one of the things that you see um, growing up in a small town like Haverhill is bigger places and you're young and uh, barely 21 years old and an opportunity came up in uh, Laconia, New Hampshire down in the Lake City. And uh, I jumped at that and went down there and spent about 12 years uh, out on the street um, and was one of the city's founding members of the Mountain Bike Community Policing Unit and uh, also a field training officer training the new recruits that we brought on. And back in the late 90s, a unique opportunity came up where a new police chief who would come in uh, wanted me to go and uh, work on the uh, Attorney General's Drug Task Force. Um, so I became a detective and for several years, uh, that's what I did, was covert uh, drug investigations, undercover work. That was my primary focus. Um, eventually, another position uh, opened up within the department in what we call the General Detective Bureau. So I was able to uh, take over that position where I also became the assistant city prosecutor. I was never a prosecutor in the superior court level, but I did all the grand jury presentations and I um, did all the, uh, or I should say a lot of the prosecution in the uh, circuit court, which used to be the district court. Um, and I also did all the pre-employment investigations, was entrusted in me as well to investigate everybody that was going to potentially get a job at the police department as well as the um, facilitation of polygraphs and administration of psychological evaluations. In 2011, uh, I realized that I was coming towards retirement. I had always wanted to move back to uh, Haverhill, to my home roots. My lovely wife is here tonight. We have two really awesome children. And I thought it would be great for them to have the same benefit that I did of being close to their grandparents. My mom and dad still live uh, in the town that I grew up in. So um, I started working part-time right here, right here at this university part-time. It's a fun job. I'm still there today. That is my part-time employment, uh, working for the university. And I've been doing that about seven years. Um, just kind of weaned my way into it uh, from Laconia before I retired completely. But another job came up on the horizon. Um, in Bradford, Vermont, um, where I'm now the police chief. I've been the chief of police there for six years. Um, I have a three-person agency, uh, two of which work mostly full-time, another one works part-time. I also have a part-time secretary. Um, and it's a beautiful little town of about 2,800 people. I'm sure many of you have been there along the Connecticut River. And farmway. Yes, for the farmway <laughs> town. That's what everybody calls it. Um, there's a lot of great places there. So it's given me kind of a very unique perspective because I had to get recertified all over again, even though I've held on to my New Hampshire uh, certification and, and kept that up to date. Um, most of your fugitives that leave uh, Grafton County go across the river into uh, Vermont. And Vermont is one of four states that have a very unique way of um, processing fugitives um, you know, back into uh, the Granite State to take care of the justice piece with the county attorney's office. Um, but I can bring a lot to the table with 33 going on, 34 years of experience. Um, still love this job. I'm 51 years old. As I said, I'm married, have two wonderful children. I live in uh, the village of North Haverhill in the town of Haverhill and have thought about being sheriff for some time and uh, figured, well, I better take a swing at it. And if you folks are good enough to elect me in the primary, 
wonderful. I'll move on and see what happens in the general election. And if I win that for you folks and everybody else in this county, I'll get to work. And if I don't, I'll get out my bucket list and scratch off run for elected office. <laughs> I do want to make very clear, though, that I am not intent. We have currently have a sheriff that is a seven-term incumbent uh, going for an eighth term. Um, I am not out to do that. I am fifth, I'll be 52 years old in a few weeks. I still feel very young. I have kids that keep me, and a wife, that crack the whip on me. But the reality of it is I am looking at this from the advice of several sheriffs I had the good fortune of working with over the years um, that told me, go into this with your eyes focused on serving three really solid terms. That job is your job every two years to decide the evaluation of the sheriff, of whether or not you're going to keep he or she in that job or you want to make a change. I think it's time for a change. So I don't want to mislead anybody and say I'm looking to be the sheriff for the next five or six or you know seven terms going forward. Like they said, three solid terms, a fourth if you have to, but cultivate people from within so you can present them to the voters that want the job. So now before I start closing and fans start moving quicker, I'll pass you on to... Uh, Thank you, well spoken. Well, if anyone is too cold, let me know, and I'll have someone turn up the heat. My name is Travis Austin, and obviously I'm running for sheriff. Uh, a little background on me. I grew up in Vermont, a little town called Danville, which is uh, just across the river from Littleton. And I graduated from high school there. And when I was 18, I moved down here to attend Plymouth State College at the time. And I went to school for environmental biology. Uh, unlike Jeff, I never had dreams or aspirations of becoming a police officer because I went to school for environmental biology. After graduating, uh, I had some downtime while I was looking for jobs, and I decided to do a police ride-along with the town of Bristol. And about five, ten minutes into my ride-along, the lieutenant looks at me and says, so you're doing this ride-along because you want to become a police officer and you're applying for our open job, right? And I'm like, I didn't know you were hiring. And he said, oh, well, here's an application. Fill it out. You never know. So I fill out the application. I ended up with a job, and I figured, worst case scenario, I can give it a try and see how it works. And uh, it turns out I really enjoy police work. I especially enjoy the community relations aspect to the job. Uh, after spending a couple years full-time in, in Bristol, I, uh, I went to work for the Hebron Police Department full-time and remained on part-time with Bristol for several years. I've been chief of Hebron for about five years now. And uh, some of the reasons why I, I want to actually run for sheriff and become sheriff is, as Jeff said, I've been chief now for about five years. And if you haven't accomplished what you want to accomplish in about five years in an administrative role, it's time to move on. And I feel like I've accomplished a lot for the town of Hebron, and I have a lot to offer at the county level. Uh, when I took over as the chief of Hebron, I was the only employee of the police department, just a lone chief, no tribe. And uh, so I started the recruitment process. And uh, I was really successful at getting some really high caliber employees to join. Uh, we have currently seven part-time officers and myself full-time. And each of those seven officers work full-time in law enforcement elsewhere. And uh, they all hold, hold uh, good positions. We have a, a deputy chief, a sergeant, a detective, a couple of patrol officers. One of my officers just uh, actually got promoted to captain at the state prison uh, this week, so that's awesome for him. But uh, I've tried to grow an environment within the town and a relationship with our community that encourages people to want to come and work for me. And uh, I feel like I've been really successful at that. A lot of our police officers are exceptionally talented in their areas of expertise. And they're the people that I can rely on to go to when I need that information. Because as we all know, um, a good leader doesn't necessarily have to know how to do everything, but needs to know who they can talk to and go find those answers for. Uh, so as sheriff, I feel like I could take my, my personality and my ability to attract quality personnel to improve the sheriff's department when turnover arises. Thank you. Okay, first question. Um, other than statutory requirements that we have in the RSAs, what do you feel is the role of the Grafton County Sheriff's Department within the community? Um, and what would you do to increase or reduce the current level of support? He took the first question on Monday night, so we'll be fair. <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> I'm not telling you lose. Please repeat the question because it was kind of long. I want to make sure that I accurately honor. 
other than the statutory requirements of the RSA, uh, what do you think the role of the, the Grafton County Sheriff's Department should be within the community? And what would you do to increase or reduce the current role? Okay, that was a two-part question. Uh, <laughs> the RSA that outlines the, the responsibilities of the sheriff is RSA 104. And that was already touched upon at the beginning, what those primary three things are, the civil process, prisoner transport, and court security. Those are the three big ones. Uh, currently, the Sheriff's Department is comprised of nine full-time deputies. And from what I've learned from driving around the county and talking with people, as well as being a police officer in the county and, and knowing most of these deputies, um, we have some deputies that are really good at getting out into the communities and being a part of communities that they're assigned to. And we have some deputies that could be encouraged to do a little bit more activeness within their community, stopping while they're in uniform at the, uh, the events on the common and, and things like that. Uh, as sheriff, I would lead by example. Uh, I promise to you that if I became sheriff, I would not be in Haverhill five days a week, 40 hours a week sitting in the office but I'd be spending a lot of time out on the road, getting into each of the communities throughout the county, meeting with the local stakeholders and the prominent community members and talking to everyone at the community events to get their perspective on what their interests are, what their wants are, and bring that back to the county and uh, try implementing that as much as possible. It would also make uh, transparency and it would make uh, people feel like they were closer to their sheriff's department. So those, that would be the big thing that I want to work on with the, the community relations. So with respect to the sheriff's office, um, I know that uh, Chief Austin's uh, facts are correct, that they have nine part-time deputies, but they also have a $56,000 line item for part-time uh, employees as well that they utilize. So one of the things that needs to be looked at is exactly, uh, you know, where people are, what they're doing, what the job tasks are. There's actually four specific duties of the sheriff's office, the civil process, the court security, the service of the, um, the court uh, warrants that come out was what um, was not in included in that. Um, and then obviously the service of civil writs as well. Um, so in the, or excuse me, the transportation of prisoners. So you have prisoner transport, arrest warrants that get sent out by the court, civil process and court security. Those are the four primary things. But like with any job, for any of you that have ever managed something, there's always going to be some downtime. So to kind of expand a little bit on what Chief Austin was saying, I'm a very transformational leadership type of person. I want to hear from everybody what they're looking for, what their ideas are. Because one of the biggest things you can do in a law enforcement agency is establish trust. Um, and the way to do that is to become approachable so that people get to know you. And hence, they're going to put trust in you. Because you need these people. You need everybody. Um, because if you're just out, you know, hidden uh, between four doors uh, and some glass around you with a car that says Grafton County Sheriff's Department, the problem is nobody really knows who you are when you show up at something serious and you're the first one there. That's when somebody's going to be the most talkative. If they know you, you're really going to be able to make a difference uh, in the community. So I really want to expand some community outreach there. With respect to reduction or increase in staff, I think you have to take a real hard look at, uh, at what you have there. You're also responsible for a communication center. You have a $1.6 million budget at the Sheriff's Office, and then the communication center, I believe, is 1.1. Linda, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so there's a lot of things to, uh, to really kind of drill into. Um, and as a transformational leader, I am a, also a very fact-driven person. Um, but I do care very much about what people's concerns and thoughts are about the agency and how you move it forward. We have good candidates in every office. I, we don't have any losers up here, I will say that. Um, I think you dealt with this question on Monday. I liked your answer so well, I'm going to ask it again. What do you believe is the largest public safety issue in Grafton County, and what will you do to help the community combat that issue? Well, this is my answer, and uh, I was very fortunate to have uh, Chief Austin agree with it, because you're talking about two different perspectives, two police chiefs in small towns, and uh, he worked in, as he said, in Bristol, I worked in Laconia, and we both recognize that we've covered a lot of different real estate uh, over the years. So. 
when you talk about what's the biggest, the question was public safety. When I retired in 2012, I was asked by a couple of friends of mine that were reporters in, in the Lake City, well, what's the biggest problem? Is it the drugs? Is it the robberies? Is it the assaults, et cetera? And I was sad that they never printed this, but I'm elated to be able to say this for a second time. And please don't take offense to it, because I'll expand on it. It's one word, parenting, um, or lack thereof. One of the things that law enforcement, you know, we do a lot of different things, but one of the things we see is when kiddos are in a, you know, a negative um, type of, or a lot of negative current um, in their living situation, uh, it's a cultivation stage, you know, for kids. You see how, you know, kids' behaviors. I told you earlier, I did a lot of the uh, prosecution um, in Laconia, and that's because we had two courtroom, qu courtrooms going most of the time, juvenile and adult in the circuit court. So I saw a lot of really sad situations um, and parents that just were not involved. And it really becomes problematic because it, can, it leads to drug use, it leads to criminal activity. Um, and I just think that's the biggest problem is getting, you know, it's, it's not the fault of the police that crime's running rampant or it's not the fault of the school teachers that, um, you know, kids aren't meeting the, the grade or whatever. It's more about getting everybody to engage in family. It's, it's the most important thing. Um, you know, if my wife told me tonight, you, you can win sheriff or you can come home and, you know, uh, be with the kids, you've got an option. I mean, congratulations. <laughs> I'm calling that way. But parenting is so, so important. And I, I ask everybody, is a, a, thank God we're all wired different. Everybody in this room, you know, to help other people, you know, with parenting. You don't want to be invasive with somebody's business or anything like that, but everybody should be an advocate of parenting. We will have a better society. I look at things in a far more global perspective than just looking at something like, oh, somebody broke the law. Okay, that's easy. But what's the, what's the root cause? How do we get to that, eradicate it, and make things better? On Monday night, he got that question first also. I still agree with everything he says, and it still is one of the most important things that we face. Uh, so I'm just going to expand upon what, what the chief has talked about. When we talk about uh, parenting and children as they're growing up and they're learning things from their parents or the lack thereof from learning or learning the wrong things, uh, as police officers go th into households, go into neighborhoods, the one thing that we routinely see is, is, is the damage that's caused by the, the overbooking of our DCYF personnel. Their caseloads are extremely large and they don't have the time to focus on individual cases all the time. They'll prioritize um, certain instances, but they are running very behind and they have a large workload and they're constantly treading water to keep up. Uh, couple that with uh, behavioral counselors from Genesis and organizations like that, where they're also backed up and underfunded and they're the ones that are providing the good quality uh, learning and coping tools to the youth that have some not the greatest parents. Uh, it's a self-compounding problem that isn't getting better uh, anytime soon. And I think we're really starting to take a closer look at the ramifications of that overbooking of DCYF and the underfunding of that area of, of human services and the current mental health issues that we're facing right now, especially when that is coupled with mental health issues. Uh, every single town is, is facing these problems that started a long time ago that could have been mitigated from parenting or from extended resources available, um, but they're, they tend to blowing up in the early 20s, 30s, 40s, even 50s. And uh, recently, the last couple of years, we have been working nonstop covering IEA details, which is involuntary emergency admissions at Spear Hospital. Um, the, the chief covers them. He comes and works part-time from Plymouth. As the chief of Hebron, I come and cover them. And we sit with these people that are waiting for the resources to be given to them or waiting for a placement at the state hospital. So it's definitely, as the chief said, definitely issue of parenting and coupled with how that grows with the lack of resources that we have. And one final quick question. Um, in a minute or less, why would you make a good Grafton County Sheriff? Wendy worded this the same way when she asked us this question. She didn't ask us why we, we felt that we'd be better than the other one. And uh, 
we each made it a case to say, he's a great candidate. I feel I'm a great candidate. Um, you're going to have a, a good candidate to put up against the incumbent no matter what. Um, I'm going to tell you I'm not a better candidate than him. I'm just a different candidate. I have a different personality. Uh, we have a lot of shared beliefs, but my personality will lend itself to a different style of a successful sheriff's department. Um, but one thing that I can promise you is that I will always try 110% and I always do my best, not just when I'm on duty on the clock, but also in my personal life, when I'm out and about in the communities with my family without a uniform on, I'll always be my best and uh, be the best representative of the county that I can be. So the reason that I feel uh, that I'm here is because I'm here. Um, and that, you know, is really saying it all. You've heard kind of my resume. Um, reach out for me on Facebook. What I would ask you to do is, uh, much like what the chief just said, I'm not here saying I'm better than the other candidate. What I'm here saying is, you know, I have a unique and diverse background, uh, as does he. Um, so I ask, reach out on Facebook, read uh, these, uh, these pieces where I know we've both put, I know I put my resume out online for you. Don't hesitate to contact me if you have questions. I love meeting people individually. One-on-one -on -one is the best way, uh, even though we're in a digital age. Um, you know, I, I don't want to walk out into a car on my iPhone, you know, typing back and forth to you. I love sitting face to face, looking eye to eye to try and resolve issues because everybody in here is part of the prescription. Um, and on day one, if I'm elected to uh, sheriff, I mean, that's going to be how things work and we'll see how that works and hopefully uh, I'd be starting another campaign. So I thank you all for being here tonight and uh, just please, uh, in the November election, vote for one of the two people up here. <laughs> Thank you, both of you. Um, we're going to open the floor up to questions uh, for the candidates, but we have one more candidate to hear from. And she doesn't have a primary, but I am really hoping she's sitting beside me. I hope we both get elected. <laughs> but I'm going to ask Marsha Morris to come up. Marcia, Marcia, Marcia. Wow. Thank you for hanging in there with us. Um, one thing I can say is that I really do hope that I will be elected. It is, makes me so proud to be uh, standing up in a line with these wonderful candidates. And so I would love to work with any of them, um, but especially Commissioner Lauer. Um, my name is Marsha Morris. I am your Democratic candidate for Grafton County Commissioner from District 3. District 3 are, uh, is is constituted by the same towns that many of you know I covered for the local Yokel record enterprise for many years since 2007. So I'm very familiar with those communities and I feel very um, connected to them. Uh, so many of you know me as a journalist. That is one of the skills that I bring to uh, the commissioner position. I um, am very proud of my record of very factual, accurate reporting and very fair reporting. I have uh, been out there on the campaign trail, I can tell you both Republicans and Democrats are coming up to me and welcoming my candidacy and that, that means a lot to me. Um, so um, that's my first qualification. The second one is that many of you don't know was that before I came here in 2006, seven, moved here, um, I was trained professionally as a political scientist, most specifically as a mediator in mediation and conflict resolution. Um, I have a feeling that those talents that I bring to the table of being able to sit people down and listening to different points of view, whether emotional or not, um, and bringing people together to find their common ground, I think that that can be very useful in any political process. So process is very, very important to me, and that's a skill that I, I bring to the, to the job. Um, even less of you know that I'm also a recovery advocate, and that's really what I want to talk about for 30 years. I have worked in a volunteer capacity in many, many different forums to help young people become clean and sober and to put their lives back together. It's been a very long commitment. I have seen a lot of things over many, many years. Uh, in the last three or four years, I have spent a lot of time up at the county complex 
because um, that's where a lot of our young people who are falling through the cracks are landing. And I think you have a right to feel very proud about the work that's been done there in creating the drug court, the mental health court, now the veterans court, um, and some of the community corrections innovations that have been happening. And now some really exciting work happening in the correctional facility itself. And I think those things, given enough time, are going to really make a difference. Um, we're living in an opioid crisis. We're living really in New Hampshire in a mental health care crisis. Um, I could go on and on and on about that. I won't. Um, but it, you know, we're, this is a, a generational it, it, it problem. We're going to be facing this for a very long time. Um, but what I would like to see accomplished up at Grafton County is a continuing of the programs that have already started, but more importantly, as I think some of these folks have alluded to, um, some more interaction with the community and community support for some of these innovations that have been going on up there. Um, I, I think they deserve it. Uh, I think I really loved hearing from so many of you that, that, that that's what we want to do is, is outreach to the community and get you more involved uh, because this problem, specifically the opioid problem, is something that we all are going to have to work together on uh, to solve. So I do not, I, I don't know whether I feel lucky or lonely up here not having an opponent. <laughs> I think mostly lucky. <laughs> Um, but you can still vote for me. I'm going to be on the ballot, so don't forget to vote for me. And uh, thank you so much for hanging in there with us. So we have seven outstanding candidates up here. Um, questions from the audience? Yes. But you've both chosen to run as Democrats. So I want to know what makes each of you a Democrat and how your values as Democrats would shape the way you did the job. Did everybody hear the question? That's a good question. That's a very good question. <laughs> it's an excellent question. Um, for me, what um, I was told in the police academy at a very young age when I was all of about 18 years old to, with a very, well, there was an explicit word that I won't repeat, but to stay the beep out of politics. And I subscribed to that. Grew up in a very, I guess I would call it conservative town up in Haverhill uh, where everybody had Mel Thompson signs up when, uh, when I was a young boy. Um, but however, when I was in Laconia, um, we went through a transition that um, the administration really did a very poor job. Um, and I did not like the way that things were being done in our department as a whole, meaning our workforce, decided to unionize. Now that was something that I was brought up totally. Boy, you don't join a union. That's not, you know, nobody needs that. Well, I'll tell you what, not only did I join, I became the secretary, the vice president, and then the president. And uh, from there, um, I got into the New Hampshire Police Association, which is a benevolent association for uh, all about 3,000 police officers in the state, as well as 10,000 retired people that have retired honorably. And you get to be a representative. It's about an eight-year hitch. And I'll tell you, the last couple of years, working with Governor Lynch um, and uh, even Senator Shaheen and many Democrats, I was just so inspired by the work that they did, especially Governor Lynch. I don't know how uh, he reflects with you folks, but I have a beautiful letter that he sent me uh, when I retired, and we did uh, a lot of great work, I thought, uh, when I was there. Um, so with respect to um, you know my values in that piece, I don't think there's anybody in this room or even out on that street that can support the current platform that's going on on a national level. And it's, you know as well as I do, leadership starts at the top, like Chief Austin and I were talking about, like the county attorney's candidates were talking about. The reality, leadership starts at the top. That all trickles down. It needs to change. Um, and that's why I'm a proud member of your party, our party. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, I grew up in a rural section of Vermont, and it was definitely a heavy Democrat liberal undertone in the area I grew up in, so it's kind of ingrained in me. Uh, I went to Plymouth State College, which is also a very liberal grounds also. Um, so I've been surrounded by the Democratic ideals for my whole life, essentially, uh, with the exception of when I moved to Hebron 
and I didn't look at the political map at all before I moved there and realized that's one red town. <laughs> So, like Chief Stiegler, um, I've, I've usually kept pretty quiet on my political beliefs because Hebron's very conservative, but uh, I'm usually the quiet guy in the back at the town meetings. And uh, surprisingly, by speaking my platform and speaking about my beliefs, I've gotten a lot of encouragement and, and some really, really good remarks from the conservatives in the town that I work and live in. Uh, I certainly subscribe to and believe in every aspect of the platform of the Democratic Party. Uh, everything from the women's rights to livable wages, yeah. affordable or free health care for everyone. It's a right. Yeah. Um, when, when I sit in uh, Grafton County Police Chiefs Association meetings, um, I'm constantly reminded that I am definitely the minority in the group of police officers. Um, a lot of police officers tend to, to lean conservative, and when we discuss items of... Uh, especially things like marijuana legalization. Um, I'm in the vast minority. I'm a supporter of a regulated market. I believe that's the best way to, but that's the best and only way to keep it out of the hands of youth. And uh, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on, but you know, I'm, I'm definitely blue. Uh, if you look at my voting history, um, I've been undeclared since being in Hebron. And that is because I like to reserve the right in the primaries to support some of the uh, central uh, more central Republican or Democrat uh, local politicians that uh, we have running, you know, because sometimes we actually have some that are really near the middle, and, and I want to support them because they'll do a lot for us at the state. But uh, definitely, I'm blue to the core, and, and that's why I'm running as a Democrat. Next question. Yes. Um, the commissioner asked you a question about what you thought the most uh, important issue facing uh, the sheriff's department was. You both gave the same answer on that, but I didn't hear you answer her second part of the question is, how would you support the communities in those issues? Can you do that for us, please? Okay, and I think the question was, we, you both identified uh, parenting as a public safety issue, and his question is, how would you support the community in improving that? See, that's why I had to have her repeat the question. I'm bad with those two or three part questions. It, Grafton County is a big county. It's 38 towns in one city. There's nine full-time deputies. There's a, a small army of part-time deputies, but limited resources with uh, wages for hours. Uh, so it becomes very difficult to have a large program for supporting certain aspects of what we both talked about extensively. But the one thing that we can do is, as the chief said, when we meet and go out in our communities and talk to people in our communities, we form connections. And a lot of the times those connections can lead to the help that's needed for their children or for them. Um, like a prime example of that happened to me today. Um, I got called because there was loose horses running around on Route 3A. And that's a, that's a 50 mile an hour road. So it's funny that the loose horses and I have to go wrangle them up, but it's also a public safety issue. Uh, so I get over there and find the horses and luckily the owner of the horses was there. And there's another person that uh, decided to stop and help. And as I'm pushing the horses back to where I know where they live, because it's a small town, there's not that many horses in town, the uh, owner takes off to go to the house to get them in the pen. And as I'm pushing them, there's this other person who's walking way up above my cruiser, stopping traffic as it's coming towards me. And I'm appreciating this because the cars are stopping, so the horses are still going where they're supposed to going. And we get them into the pen and uh, get everything off the road cleaned up. And, and I look over, and I, I see this person walking up a driveway. And I'm like, that can't be them. She was walking into what's known as, as a known drug house in the area. And I haven't seen this person in 10, 11 months. Um, but I pulled up in the driveway to thank them for their assistance. And when I pulled up, Notice that their skin color was normal. The whites of their eyes were crystal clear. And the first thing I said was, well, thank you for helping. You got clean, didn't you? And she's like, yep, I've been clean for 10 months. And we had a nice chat, and uh, we talked about how the recovery was going. And uh, she gave me a nice quote that has been inspiring her on her day-to-day -day recovery. And after she did that, I reached out to shake her hand, and I said, hi. 
my name's Chief Austin. I don't think we've met. And this is someone that I've arrested multiple times. She's even taken a couple swings at me before in the past. <laughs> so she reaches out, shakes my hand, and I say, you know, my friends call me Travis. And this version of you, you can call me Travis. And it's making these connections with people that are in difficult situations, who have families of their own in difficult situations, where next time things are rough, you know, that's going to stick with her that, hey, we, I'm treating her as an equal. I want her to be a part of the community. This morning, she was a fantastic part of the community because, frankly, I couldn't have done that as easily on my own. So when you get out into the community and treat people and approach people, that, that's connections that make the job easier to help them get those services. So with, I thought I covered or expanded a little bit. Tell me if I'm wrong when I had mentioned with respect to parenting, this is a, a job not only for the sheriff's department, our municipal, our state uh, police, but also for communities. And that was my, my piece about building some trust, um, you know, with people by getting out, getting to know them, establishing those lines of communication so that we could all work on, you know, kiddos that, you know, they've got a problem because one person can't do it. It's a multidisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach. Was that the, the piece of the question? Was there an expansion you were looking for? Yeah, I know that parenting is a very broad and ambiguous piece, so to speak. Um, but to dovetail a little bit on where Chief Austin was going, um, then you start getting into specifics, juvenile justice, restorative justice, uh, whatever the county attorney's office is working on. Hopefully you're standing you know, connected at the hip with them, um, working on these, these issues. Then you start working towards what grants are available on state and federal levels. Um, in other words, formulating a prescription, like I said earlier, identifying what the problem is, what's the prescription, and is it going to eradicate it at the root cause? Because we don't want to be back here, you know, in, in two months dealing with this, you know, happen, happening again. Um, am I hitting on that um, piece that you were looking for? Okay. Thank you again. Next question. Yes. How would you keep the community safe as it relates to gun safety? Well, uh, Governor Lynch and I had this um, conversation back in 2011 when we opposed uh, Stand Your Ground law, which unfortunately passed at that time. But one of the things you want to do is, first of all, you have to have the right laws. And sadly, uh, some time ago, um, the, uh, the current governor uh, signed a bill that uh, got rid of pistol permits. Um, I think that was a very bad move. Um, it, it compromised officer safety. It hurts with accountability. There's a lot to do with respect to gun safety, gun control. Um, the reality of it is we need to get mental health more involved. If a court can, and I would argue for this kind of legislation, and I don't want to get too philosophical, but this is just me looking at all these problematic issues, we, these horrific incidents we see on TV, and, you know, they're getting... Um, any place in the United States is too close for comfort, even in other countries when we, when we hear about these things happening. But to me in the United States, with all the resources we have, a court can issue an order that we can take away guns in the state of New Hampshire for domestic violence. But why is it that somebody can go into a psychiatrist's office and say they had a bad day at work and tomorrow they're going to go there and load up their gun and, you know, I'm just going to take this out on my boss and everybody else and the people I don't like. And the psychiatrist is going to fold the file and say, it's HIPAA law, it's confidential. Every one of these people you hear about as you follow these, these horrific incidents that have, you know, stained our nation, um, you know, with, with uh, use of guns, the reality of it is there was almost 99 times out of 100, there was a mental health issue. Why can a doctor not have the same power as a judge to just fax something over or email something over to a judge to put a stamp on it to let law enforcement get out there and go take those guns away? I don't want to infringe on anybody's Second Amendment rights. Someday the, the Constitution may need to be amended. That's way out of my pay grade. Um, people you know, at a bigger level and folks like yourself will vote on that. But the reality of it is we really need um, you know, some better gun legislation. I used to think New Hampshire, as a, especially as a detective, 
I used to get a lot of cases uh, from the state gun line. Um, Laconia had a couple of sporting goods stores in it. You'd get cases where people lie on what's called the 4473 form, and you'd go to work, um, and sometimes you'd work with ATF, with straw purchases, with people buying essentially drug dealers will send their girlfriends or friends in to buy multiple guns so that they can trade them for drugs. I mean, it's, it's a bad, bad scene out there how accessible um, you know, guns are, both with respect to mental health and with the drug trade and how they try to protect their assets. But I'm hopeful that if uh, majorities uh, can, you know, win in droves uh, going down to the State House, I'll certainly be behind all of you down in the House and the Senate to, um, and maybe even a new governor, um, to, uh, you know, try and make this, this situation better, but make it palatable for everybody. I get a lot of people in Grafton County hunt and People just take it the, the wrong way when you start saying gun control. It's, it's, it's not what it is. We're just trying to make a safe, you know, the place safe, and that's really what it's all about, and from my, my perspective. The sheriff questions are popular. These other candidates are getting jealous. <laughs> I, uh, to, I, I agree with what a lot of what Jeff said. Um, I grew up around guns, I hunted growing up, I'm a certified firearms instructor, I teach recruits and, and uh, recertify officers every year on how to use a gun. So I, I do like guns, I enjoy shooting guns. However, I'm a firm believer that gun ownership should be a privilege, not a right, and there should be some sort of sensible gun regulations uh, that are coming down the pike for this state. Uh, as he said with the, uh, the pistol permits no longer being necessary, uh, that was just for concealed pistol permits. That that didn't touch upon the fact that anyone could open carry well before that. And what makes it difficult for law enforcement is um, most law enforcement officers in the state don't have access to criminal records in their cruisers. And a lot of dispatch agencies won't just give criminal records over the air. They require paperwork to be filled out and, and to be faxed in order to get that. So when we pull over someone that has a firearm, it could be very difficult to find out whether or not that they should actually be lawfully possessing one. Um, luckily, there are some instances where uh, we get things attached to their license check, which would be whether or not they have a protective order issued against them or a domestic violence order against them, which would also prohibit them from carrying or possessing firearms. But there's very few instances where we know that are covered whether or not they should or should not have a firearm. Um, I'm also a firm believer in um, regulated gun checks. If you're going to sell a firearm to someone, you should go to a gun shop and actually go through the process of having the check done and the, the firearm number recorded that it was being transferred possession. Um, I don't think it should be something that happens on, you know, on the you know, side road or at someone's house or at a gun show. So, does that answer your question? Okay. I don't mean to, to drag on, but I'll say it uh, because we have uh, candidates for the House uh, here tonight. This is just an idea that's been pondering in my head for, for some time that I just want to throw out there. And I'll, if, whether I win or lose, I'll help you with the LSR down in Concord, uh, putting it together if it, uh, if it can grow legs. And that is, if we can run a records check on somebody and find out that they have a domestic violence order against them, and we know that when we've made a, a vehicle stop or uh, just doing a a basic follow-up investigation or whatever. Why is it that to have a firearm, it's you know, with a permit, you can't just make it an endorsement on your driver's license so the the dispatcher could see it right there in the offices where their MDCs could have it right there. It's just been an idea um, in my head that you know, firearms possession should be an endorsement on your driver's license so the officer knows. Um, you know, I spent a lot of years undercover, a lot of years in plain clothes, and a lot of years in uniform. And the reality of it is you walk up to cars not knowing. But boy, you know, once you see that license with an endorsement on it and you know that, okay, you know, I mean, that there's a potential, there's a, there's a gun involved. Um, and it would be very helpful for officer safety to have um, something like that. And with respect to what Chief Austin just said, very proud of the fact that Vermont just implemented uh, just that, that law takes effect October 1st. You can no longer, I can no longer go to this lady and she says she wants to sell me a rifle or a handgun. It has to be, we have to go to the sporting goods store together and the 4473 has to be filled out there so ATF will have a trace on the number. I can, could, couldn't even count how many cases in Laconia where we run what's called a gun trace through the BATF. It's a very simple form that you fax or email to them. How many 
guns came back that they were bought at Kmart in Guilford, New Hampshire in 1992 um, by somebody that's, you know, been deceased for years. So reality of it is people sell guns, you know, hand-to-hand -hand sales, um, and, you know, we lose track of them. And that's, that's really bad. So I'm very hopeful um, that we can get some legislation going that um, you know, promotes officer safety and just gun safety, uh, period, across the board. And sorry to drag on. Okay, we have time. One more question in the back. Okay, so you would like to hear about the experience of the attorneys with jury trials? Okay. Thanks. Alrighty, so I'm a local prosecutor right now. Um, so I actually prosecute under RSA 14010A, or colon 10 hyphen A. I'm not legally authorized to um, prosecute at the Superior Court, which is where jury trials take place. I prosecute in the Circuit Court system. But if you look at the legislative history of that, um, going back to the 1970s, if you look at um, Attorney General McLaughlin's 2002 uh, memo about police prosecuting, if you look at commentary by um, legal commentators like Attorney Nicholas Fry, and if you talk to local attorneys with lots of experience, such as Gabriel Nazetic, who's right up the road here, who's been an attorney for more than 30 years as a prosecutor, as a defense lawyer, and as a civil attorney, who's tried more than 10,000 cases, what you'll see is the complications of the cases aren't that different. Um, you're, what you're mainly looking at is you have to be a little bit careful, more careful in asking questions uh, to witnesses when there's a jury. And the reason is that is because instead of talking to someone with a high degree of legal sophistication, the judge, you're talking to 12 ordinary people. And so you have to make sure that they understand what's going on. Um, as far as the rules go, you're still practicing under the same rules of evidence. You're still doing with the same witness issues. I think I addressed that earlier in a, in a question. You're still, still um, dealing with the same um, issues the defense counsel is raising, um, usually suppression issues, so the police sees something illegally. Um, and so really, I think the, the focus of what we should be looking at is what's your experience building that case? Um, what's your experience, you know, obviously as a former juror, uh, you understand that um, the prosecution and the defense have very different roles, and the prosecution has to build the case. They have the burden to prove everything that happened, and if they can't, then they can't win that case. Um, and I think that's really important, and that's a really important distinction that we have to focus on here, um, because ultimately the rules we're focusing on are the same. I mean. Sure, I don't do opening statements often. I don't do closing statements often. I do in more complicated cases when there are many witnesses and the judge wants to know what's going on before we start calling them to the stand. Um, but that's my, that's my experience with my current role. Thank you. Um, I have to disagree somewhat with what uh, Nate said in part because, I mean, he doesn't have any experience in front of juries and the the thing about jury trials is that you have to be able to um, you have to be able to think on your feet but you will have already picked a jury so conducted a, a sort of a an artful um, exercise in jury voir dire you will have potentially deposed experts in drugs in domestic violence in sexual assault so you will have done a lot of preparation. You might have deposed the medical examiner. Um, so the cases that are heard in front of a jury or presented in front of a jury are complicated. There are, uh, it's, not, it's not like a, a traffic ticket or, or some of the, the common people's court cases that happen in circuit court, you know, that um, uh, Chief Stiegler is as familiar with as is uh, Nage. These are complex. They are 
They run many days. They are, you know, instead of 10 pages of discovery in circuit court, there are hundreds of thousands of pages that you're going through, that you're having to be organized about, and that you have to be able to be uh, confident uh, as you're talking in front of a group of strangers or peers, as well as arguing issues of law to the judge. So there's a lot more going on in a jury trial than there, than there is always in a circuit court uh, trial. So good question, which speaks again to experience in Superior Court. Thank you. So you know your job. Yeah. We need to turn that wave blue. Yeah. We need to turn Grafton County offices blue.